Mi gente, you already know who it is. It's Danny Limelight. And I need all of you to subscribe to According to Woods podcast on Facebook, YouTube, and all other platforms. What's good, party people? This is According to Woods, and I have the honor and privilege of talking to... I mean, this is kind of a international podcast here because uh joining me all the way from the other side of the pond in australia she's the one and only bellator fighter janae hollow point harding janae what's going on nothing much how are you pretty good pretty good uh honored to have you on and i'm literally like sharing this as we speak and that's shared and now we can get on. But uh, <laughs> my goodness, I mean, we're, we're kind of two, it, has it been about two weeks, a week and a half, two weeks? Yeah, just or yeah, just under two weeks, a week and a half. So yeah, it's already going pretty quickly. It feels like it was a couple of days ago, but yeah, here we are. So, I mean, I got I got asked, and we kind of talked about it a little bit off air, but in terms of like you coming from Australia to Connecticut or on the Mohegan Sun, you know, kind of uh, tribal land and what have you. Uh, what was the process like? I mean, obviously, the situation from the last the last time you fought is a little bit different, right? Like 2020 has been different in many ways, right? So in terms of like that last time to this most recent time that you fought, like what were the differences? Yeah, I mean, massive differences, obviously, a lot of unknowns, a lot of like, trying to jump through some hurdles to make sure that we could get overseas, catch our flights and everything like that. So, um, like I said, we had uh, um, to get travel exemptions, obviously, it helped that I already have a visa. So that was all good, because um, even like the consulates are closed. So I mean, like these things are all kind of, yeah, just little like hurdles. I got my visa through correspondence which is really good like i was just able to like send my info and they sent me back my passport with my visa in it which is great and i got to avoid my interview um and yeah just like which is very strange and like obviously nobody has like a playbook for any of this because it's not something that we've all encountered before but um once we got there obviously things were a little bit different getting tested getting tested before i go um temp constant temperature checks like um quarantining for the days that we did get tested until the end of the day to like until the um results came back so that then we could roam around in the the casino and everything um having separate like uh workout areas and everything that was like very interesting but i actually really enjoyed it because obviously it means like i don't have to share my space with everyone and um we basically guaranteed like a spot all the time whereas like when you have like a red and a blue corner training room in the hotel sometimes like you get down there and there's two other teams down there and that's kind of like the whole mat space gone so it was that was really really good um it also like i said this like all week it also felt like it was like more organized and we were more time efficient so therefore like sitting in our little areas getting onto the scales straight away um and then like getting kind of herded and everything was like very kind of processed in a specific way so that like we were in and out straight away which was really really cool because it gave us like the rest of the day to cook food or or like buy food or chill out or nap or like whatever we needed to do i got like everything usually like fight weeks like chaos in a sense because you're just like okay like i've got to be here for photos at this time i've got to sign the posters i got to like all these little like bits and pieces medicals whatever it is it always just takes like a little bit longer than you expect and then like maybe i would try to get a nap in or something or i'd want to try to get a nap and i wouldn't have enough time so this like fight week was like the breeziest fight week because i got to do everything that i needed to do like i did yoga basically every day i got like all of my mobility stuff and all those little extras that like you really intend to do but like sometimes you just don't have time and um like it's fight week so like that's all you can expect but yeah but this time around it was amazing um and there was a lot of like us like getting our shakeouts in and and the cut was really good i woke up on weight so i mean that that was like kind of scary just because 
like when you're quarantining for a day, like it's fight week, you're sitting in your hotel room all day. You're like, oh my God, like, like obviously I was trying to exercise, but there's only so much you can do. It's not like a crazy big workout or anything. And, um, and obviously that plays in your mind because you're like, I'm not burning calories. I'm not like, I'm not doing what I usually would on fight week. But, um, but all in all, it ended out fine. Like it's just like, basically it was a waste of energy stressing about it, but, um, it worked out good. And Mackenzie uh, Dern, Mackenzie Dern. Oh uh, yes, yes. Where she, you know, she kind of uh, attributed, you know, coming from Brazil and then coming basically back to the states, or actually vice versa. Okay. Either way works. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> sorry, uh, it's better. No worries, no worries. But basically, she attributed, you know, going, you know, from the U.S. to Brazil for kind of one of the 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 reasonings why she wasn't on weight for a particular fight. So it's kind of cool that you just like woke up on weight and been okay. Yeah. I mean, like, that's like my, this was my sixth international fight. My fifth fight was matched up earlier in the year to fight in the UK, which I was looking forward to, but I've done those flights as well before. And they are extremely long. Um, and even like if I was, to fight in Italy, which I was also matched up to fight in, like, that's an extremely long flight as well, usually, like, 30 to 40 hours of traveling all up, and that's, like, these are the things, like, yeah, it's super unfortunate, and it's not where you want to be sitting for 30 to 40 hours, but at the same time, like, that's exactly what you put your name down for, and, and I mean, that's what happens, like, the only other option is moving to the US or, or moving to a more central area, um, which we all have the capabilities to do, I'm sure, like with the help of managers and everything like that. But um, but for me, it's like I choose to stay in Australia. So this is what I get for choosing to stay here. And, and I guess I just have to adjust to, to, to the travel and everything. It's sort of like I kind of know what I'm coming into. I, I know what to do when I get on the flights. I know like when to start my water load and, and all these kind of little things and all the tricks of the trade to make sure that I'm not like retaining the water on the flight and everything like that. You just kind of adjust and, and figure it out. And my last two fights, my last fight, I woke up 400 grams off and this fight I woke up on weight. So yeah, like I, I've figured it out. I, I've definitely like listened to my body. Obviously 145 isn't a majorly big cut for me. Like, um, I do still cut like a good, like probably like throughout the camp, like a good 10 kilos, but it's not like a strenuous 10 kilos and my body's pretty used to it by now. So I guess I am pretty lucky in that sense. If I was like a lighter weight or something, I'm sure it'd be harder, but yeah, it's sort of just like you just deal with the travel and, and do what you do and, and get there the best as you can and then yeah, make up for it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Which I, I want to ask because like, to me, at least outwardly, it looks like in terms of the on-screen presentation, um, Bellator, in terms of all of the fights uh, that have taken place during the COVID era, uh, including like UFC's Fight Island and what have you, like what they have in, in Mohegan Sun, it, I think it looks the best aesthetically. And I mean, they've got a, like a whole kind of, uh, what do they call it? The fight sphere or something like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure that's the, the word for it. I think Fight it's team. brilliant. It's brilliant. Yeah. Because, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that, and maybe this is just the Fiji in me, in me, but when you're like Fight Island, like, give me a palm tree in the background. I mean, you already know there's... <laughs> Let it be outside. Around, you know, and yeah. that's, that's one of the things that the UFC kind of has done is like to make every scenic location look exactly like the one before it, right? But... One thing that Bellator yeah. has been able to do during this kind of time is really, you know, almost treat like the fight sphere like a like a TV set, like a production, right? And uh, yeah, you know, visually, the colors that they use are so vibrant, they're so inviting. You still have the walkouts, you know. I, I think it's I think Bellator is doing it the best in terms of TV presentation. But what was it like for you? Yeah, I mean, like, um, I did a little sneaky check out of, like, see what I could see of the cage when we got there, um, and I could only really see, like, they had, like, curtained around the outside, so it really was, like, a sphere in that sense where, like, all the production was on the inside, so I was like, okay, cool, like, I won't see it until, like, 
um, like public weigh-ins, ceremonial weigh-ins. And, um, and then when I saw it in a ceremonial, I was like, this is beautiful. Like, this is wonderful. Like they still had, um, they always do that thing where they put all the champions on the, like the banner and stuff. And it's usually quite high, but due to obviously it being a little bit more contained, um, they were a little bit lower and that looked really cool. There was a lot more like, um, like the walk, obviously like the walkout as everyone saw was like that Bellator name, which is like very um, common for them to do. But at the same time, it was just like felt a little bit more intimate with it being smaller, with the curtains being around the, it wasn't a lot of echo, to be honest, like you would have expected there to be a lot of echo because like there wasn't anyone there. But um, I guess it was kind of filled with officials, like everyone setting up the cage, social, like production, PR, all these people were like actually there, of course. Um, and involved in everything. So it really didn't feel that empty, um, which was kind of cool. It just felt like the Bellador team, your corners, the referees, and then, like, I guess, like, yeah, like, curtains around us, and we were just in, like, a small gym almost, like, with a really cool walkout with lots of lights and a lot of cameras around. But, like, it, all in all, it felt, like, really intimate and really, like, well-organized, especially. So so I really enjoyed it. Like, I, everyone all week was sort of like, oh, like, how do you feel about not having a crowd, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, I feel like it'll be fine. Like, I don't know. And then, honestly, I didn't even notice. Like, I didn't even notice when I was fighting, like, it just felt like, obviously, it was a lot more quiet, but I guess, like, I was still honed in on the task at hand and, and the fight itself, and I guess it wasn't until after that I was like, okay, well, I'm not necessarily going to address the crowd or any sense. I'm going to address more the, the cameras, but, yeah, other than that, it was, like, it was really good. Like, it sort of, like, didn't take away from the experience at all, and, and it and it, like, the way they set it up made it the production looked amazing for one. Like that was the main thing. Visually looked really cool. And then I, like on top of that, it felt really nice. I, I love it. I love it. And uh, I, I love the fact that it looked as well to you as it did to us at home. So that's pretty oh. cool. It's an enjoyable experience, especially if you're, I mean, literally traveling across continents to do, I mean, you would think that you would get some sort of joy about it, right? Yeah, definitely. And I'm always like that, like, um, even for my first fight, I'm like, or even my first international fight was just like on a low level Hong Kong show. And it was just sort of like, make sure that you're taking all of these experiences in. you've got to do all this travel, you got to do all these things, but see it as a positive, like see it as an opportunity. I'm traveling for my work, I'm traveling for my dream job, like this is my dream and I'm realizing these things so make sure that like um, no matter where you go and kind of all the experiences you do to just like take a second to be in the moment and, and actually experience it like for what it is and and so like I'm super grateful that I do that usually and then on top of it like this time it just felt like it was easier to do like all week I was just sort of like man like it's the middle of a pandemic and we're traveling um, we're in a beautiful hotel like the Mohegan Sun is beautiful. Connecticut is beautiful, especially like the view from my room was amazing because it was like the lake and everything and it was snowing the, like the second day we got there and I haven't seen snow since I like was living in New Zealand. So all of these things, like they all just added to the experience and it really made it like really, really cool. I, I, that's so brilliant. That's so brilliant. And again, for somebody that's, uh, I mean, essentially a beautifulist, right? Like the beauty and the serenity of it all that had to be pretty cool, which I have to ask, right? For those who don't know, um, obviously, I mean, a complete mixed martial artist uh, competing in boxing, not just MMA, but I mean, how did you get started and what was your kind of like first impressions of like combat sports? Um, I first started in combat sports when I was, I think about 10. I um, did karate first. That was like my first discipline. Um, very like, typical like young kind of hobby idea that you could do somewhat safer than I guess any of our other sports like combat sports especially um I did karate for maybe like I think about five years um I got my black belt and then I just like literally straight from there moved to MMA that was sort of like like I wasn't I wasn't I didn't start in like striking or boxing or anything I just went straight into MMA as a whole and then um did it as a hobby and then once I finished school I started doing it more as a career and then like during my career was when I dabbled in a bit of boxing I did a couple of Muay Thai fights like these were all things that sort of came up and obviously jiu-jitsu comps and and that kind of thing that came up as I went along so yeah it was really good 
Now, obviously, I mean, traditional karate, you, you know, you're, when you talked about the adaptation to, you know, MMA, you see, like, obviously, you know, Bellator alum, you know, Lyoto Machida, right? But, I mean, that's not the tradition, like, most people that do, like, traditional martial arts stay in the traditions, learn the kata and all that jazz, but, like, they almost are negated and, and discouraged from competing in, like, mixed martial arts. So, like, what was it about mixed martial arts at the time that you were like, hey, I think I think I might do that? Yeah, well, it's funny because I didn't actually know what MMA was, to be honest. Like, it wasn't like I was – it wasn't like I saw the UFC or something and was like, I'm going to do that. Um, it was more that when I was doing karate, I felt like I was – like – needed something that was a little bit more mature. I felt like what I was getting out of karate wasn't quite what I wanted. Like I wanted something a little bit more realistic, something that I felt um, a little bit more confident in myself, like growing, like as I was slowly growing up, I was 15 when I started MMA, but um, I did feel like I was kind of at that stage where I was like, I, I don't know if, if I was in like a real time situation, I don't know if this karate stuff would actually help me out. Like it was really something that I was questioning. I didn't feel like this, high caliber athlete that I wanted to be. I didn't feel like karate kid, I guess you see on the TV. I didn't, I didn't feel like that. So I was like, I want that feeling. I want to feel like what I'm learning is useful and it, like not, not to negate from, from karate. Like, of course I used a lot of things that I learned along my journey. And I, I guess I still kind of do, especially with like a lot of my kicks and stuff. Um, but I definitely, once I did transition to MMA, I just so happened to be like around the corner from an MMA gym at the time. Um, and I gave it a go and I was like, okay, this was like, um, there's no, I guess like other than jujitsu, there was no real uniform. There was no real ranking. It was like, you were literally just learning skills. Whereas in karate, I guess the gym that I was at was like a little bit more about money. So it was sort of like, you pay the money, you get the belt you pay the money, you get the belt, you pay the money, you do the tournament, you pay the, yeah, this is just like constantly doing that. And I was like, it shouldn't really be about that. It should be like, if I'm deserving of competing, if I'm deserving on this higher rank and all these things. So once I sort of like was seeking out that more of a path and then I stumbled, literally stumbled upon MMA. Um, and then I guess once I did MMA, I just like kept falling in love with it more and more. It sort of unraveled for itself that this was sort of like where I wanted to be. Combat sports was definitely where I wanted to be. And um, I guess that individual aspect as well was like something that I really craved um, and, I, and I enjoyed. So, yeah, it was something that sort of like slowly but surely like revealed itself as I went along. Yeah, that, I, I think that's amazing. But I mean, what were your, your, your family's kind of impressions of? Obviously, you know, uh, a kind of a combat discipline in, in karate, but it is something that you can do theoretically socially distance, right? Like you could learn yeah. the moves, learn the forms and everything, but like, oh, watching your baby girl get punched in the face, that couldn't have been a easy thing to kind of uh, work out for your family. So what were their impressions? Yeah, definitely. I mean, like, especially when I did my first few like karate competitions, I was very passive. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I literally wouldn't strike first. Um, it was almost like a negative of how like passive I was. Um, and so it was hard to see how that kind of passive approach was going to come and translate into something like MMA, which is a lot more contact. I mean, like obviously karate is contact, but you have a lot of protective equipment. I really don't think you know how to generate as much power in some of the karate, like especially back then when I was younger too, like it, it wasn't really about that. And so I guess transitioning to MMA um, was a little bit more confronting for sure, but um, it's always just been mum and I, mum's a single parent and I'm an only child. So it's sort of just been like our ability to sort of trust each other and then I guess like for that reason she she knows me like she knows like my maturity level and all these things how I hold myself as a person so um it was sort of like once we started at the gym out the coach that I first started with Vincent Perry who I always credit um he was like a great like a perfect first coach for me, especially because um, we basically walked in there and he was like, I would never let her compete if she wasn't ready. Like I wouldn't, um, obviously I'm not going to put her in any danger. Like basically just staring my mom in the eye and just telling her straight facts and, and promising her all these things that he always followed through with. And, and he was definitely a man of his word um, in that sense, which gave her a lot of confidence to be putting her 15 year old daughter in like a MMA gym um, full of obviously like 
20 to 30 year old men um, that were a lot bigger than me, a lot stronger than me, but at the same time, like always looked after me and became family, obviously along the line um, as well. So my first fight was pretty confronting for her, but at the same time, mum's always just trusted me. And I guess we've had that like mutual respect in a sense that um, this is what I love to do. This is something that gives me a lot of passion. So therefore, like the pros outweigh the cons. And, and I guess like now I've almost like given that a lot of value in itself because I've taken it as far as I have. So it sort of worked out in the end and she definitely trusted me for good reason. I think it's brilliant. I think it's brilliant. And, and the trust, I mean, that's a, that's, that's something that you absolutely need. Yeah. And uh, Emilio Sanchez says, once you start in combat sports at a young age, it's pretty much over. It becomes your life. <laughs> Very true. Right. Very true. You almost get addicted too early. I'm glad I did. Definitely. Now, in terms of uh, obviously coming from a striking discipline like karate, right? Uh, so in terms of like, Learning the ground game. Uh, I mean, was that something that you're kind of hesitant towards doing, you know, in your kind of initial outings? Or was it something that you kind of adapted to a little bit well? Or did you kind of go towards like the striking disciplines before you, you, you kind of evolved into the ground? Yeah, it definitely was sort of the last piece of the puzzle. When I first started MMA, I was gravitating more to striking and everything. I was learning the basics, like singles and doubles. And um, I guess I wasn't really doing jujitsu as per se. I was doing like more MMA when I first started because I was only training more as a hobby, like with school and work and everything. I, like I could only do two, three days a week. And um, I think I started with just like basic like bridge and roll, like maybe some like arm bars from mount, like all these like basic sort of MMA moves. And then once I did finish school, that was obviously once I started training five to six t days a week and I was doing like jujitsu for at least two to three of those. And, and then that's when I started really adding jujitsu on as like its own discipline. Um, Obviously, like, throughout my journey, I have always sort of gravitated more towards striking. That's definitely been my preference, and it's been something that I find I've had a better relationship with learning striking than I have with jiu-jitsu. Like, as much as I now am in love with jiu-jitsu, it was really, like, an up and down. It was like, okay, like, I'm really enjoying learning, and then I was like, I hate getting smashed all the time and not, like, feeling like I'm progressing, and then I'm really enjoying it, and then again, maybe the environment wasn't good or like whatever it was because I did a lot of travel and that really sort of changes it's like easy to travel with strike because you can kind of like slot yourself in wherever but I do feel like with a jiu-jitsu curriculum it's really hard to just like slide on into different gyms and be moving around all the time it's it's hard to like like track your progress and, and create like the best kind of learning journey um and whereas now like i'm in a really really good spot with king's academy um in sydney elvis sinistic obviously like very very high level machado black belt um the guys at that gym are obviously credit to his teaching and therefore like i'm just learning so much i'm in a like a in that same environment that I started in, like I said, my, my original coach Vincent Perry is also a Machado black belt, also around that same age as Elvis, kind of came up with Elvis in a sense. So very similar vibes, very like um, wise, I guess you could say, like just that sort of like high level of jiu-jitsu, like that old school jiu-jitsu, I guess when you say old school and new school, like a lot of people sort of compare the two, I'm I'm definitely gravitating towards more of those basics because my, I know that my jiu-jitsu style is MMA, so I really just take away kind of like solid positions, like heavy top control, all, the, all these basic things that I, I really think these guys sort of like do the best in a sense. And, um, and for me, like it creates a really good environment. Like there's no egos. It's just one of those gyms that you don't want to leave at the end of the day. You're still talking shit till like eight, 9 PM. You're like, okay, I need to go home and eat and shower and everything like that. But that's the environment that I definitely feel like I thrive the most in. Like Atmos is like almost better than I guess, world-class coaching in a sense. And I'm just lucky I have both. So, so yeah, it's good. No, absolutely. And uh, I mean, it's cool, you know, to have that rapport with your colleagues that you can just like fuck around a bit and whatever. And I always like to think in terms of, uh, you know, when you train and sweat and bleed together, it's one of those like a tight knit communities where um, let's say if somebody, you know, kind of did a dirty move in terms of jujitsu, might've rolled the knee bar a little bit too hard or, you know, like maybe 
got you and uppercutted you and went like instead of like 20 they went 70 percent or whatever you're probably gonna go like hey that's probably somebody i don't want to you know go out and hang out with because if they can do this here when nobody's watching like what must they do when people are watching yeah 100 percent. i feel like that sort of ethos within a gym is super important i mean like having guys that you trust makes you want to go to all the sessions makes you want to you know add extra sessions on with these people because you trust them and, and you have that good level of kind of i guess creating together rather than like there's egos and competition in a negative sense so yeah like definitely makes a massive difference i think um all around especially in a gym um like a martial arts gym for sure no absolutely and uh Emilio Sanchez says the basics in jiu-jitsu makes your game 100%. 100%. I like always stress. I'm like, there's no point learning. Like there's a lot of guys that are attracted to jiu-jitsu or attracted to like this trendiness of i guess martial arts at the moment especially mma um and they try to do all the fancy stuff you know trying out twisters and, and heel hooks from the get-go but like the basics will build your game phenomenally and for people like me i mean i i just sunk a, a rear naked on a on a jiu-jitsu black belt like that's not because i'm trying to try anything fancy i'm not trying to do any twisters or anything i'm not trying to do anything highlight reel on the ground highlight reel in the feet always but on the ground not so much and for that reason like that's why i haven't been subbed like i really feel like basics are just so underrated like and these are the things that are gonna like progress you through something like mma especially a lot no, 100%. And uh, Colin Crandall from uh, the MMA Power Hour wants to know, well, he says great work. Thank you. But it's it's Thank more uh, Janae that that's brings the, uh, the interview to life. But uh, what do you think your response is to MMA in Australia getting so much bigger in the last couple of years? And do you think it could get even bigger? I think um, the ch I, th I don't think it was just like... A a lot of guys getting signed internationally because we've always sort of had that and especially when i started mma um we had a lot of international guys but it was once we had those international guys going for titles and winning titles these two things like just skyrocketed mma in australia i think it's amazing because it made a lot of people think like I think there was like a stigma beforehand that like, oh, we're all the way in Australia. We don't have the high level wrestling. We don't have the high level coaching. We don't have jujitsu coming from South America. We don't have all these things and we don't have all these influences. So it's going to be really hard for us to catch up on an international scene. And then we have people like Rob Whitaker, Israel Adesanya, Alex Volkanovsky, all of these guys, Martin Nguyen, who's in 1FC, like all of these guys who are just getting belts left side, right and center because like they made something and they made like they learned what they could learn in Australia. It doesn't mean that we were kind of, I guess, less available to us of like good coaching. It was just that we had to have that belief. I think that we could get more championship gold. And then once that happened, everyone else was like, okay, I can make a career of this and I can actually do this. And it's going to end up being exactly where I need to be. So, and I don't need to move overseas and I don't need to, you know, like live in the U S or wherever it is. So um, it's been really, really good. And it's been really cool to see, like, like I said, like I started I mean, when I was 15, which means as much as I wasn't competing till I was about 18, it means that I was watching the scene. I was watching the promotions. I was watching these small local shows. Then that's all we had was like may maybe like 1,000 people max in like a, a PCYC type hall kind of vibe. Um, often like that was maybe there was maybe like four or five promotions going around Australia. They weren't really, no one was making any money. They were all really just doing it for the love of the sport or like just trying to like add to the, the scene. And then eventually, and now like we have promotions like Eternal and that that are shown on, on Fight Pass and, and that are getting recognized as the champions from there are actually good contenders for that weight class and, and, and are getting put on the pound for pound like uh, rankings and everything like that, which is really, really cool. Like, because that's the stuff that I guess we got neglected for before because we just couldn't get the exposure. And now we've got these champions, we've got these high level guys, even like when you look at maybe, I think like the last three or four weeks, we've had people like Jimmy Crute, um, Taito Ivasa, Jacob Malkoon. We've had the boxing scene. We've had the Maloney's we've had, um, 
like all these guys that have fought and like left the country, Martin Nguyen, um, pretty much I'm just thinking of everyone that's quarantined, Arlene Blanco, um, all these like Australian, New Zealand guys. Um, we've got Casey O'Neill that just got signed to the UFC. We've got Chelsea Hackett fighting on the Contender Series soon. Mm-hmm. We've got um, Shannon McClellan fighting in UAE Warriors. So all these guys are like flying out. Everyone's flying out now. During a pandemic, you would have thought maybe like five, ten years ago, Australia would have just been scrapped as an option, I reckon. Like, it would have just been like, oh, it's not really worth the exposure, the cost of quarantine, it's not worth the flights, it's not worth all these things. But now, like, we're really getting pushed because we're exciting fighters and we're, like, we're winning fights, obviously, internationally, and we're all, like, doing really well. So I think, like, it's phenomenal to see how much the um, Australian MMA scene, as you can see, I'm very passionate about, like, the Australian MMA scene, but it's just because, like... I've watched this, like, I've watched these guys, I've watched me, like, having to be, like, how am I possibly going to get any more fights because no one will fly me overseas, no one will, like, no one really wants a bar of you, and then once I did get overseas, I did all the things I needed to do, and I came back to Australia, now these guys are getting opportunities, and that's awesome, and I will only continue to grow, like, we won't need to leave Australia, you won't need to go overseas, because the population of like people in mixed martial arts will grow in Australia and then on top of that we'll get more opportunities to fly overseas because we're seen as such a, a great bunch of people in the MMA community. So yeah, it's only going to grow from here. I know. And I mean, you've definitely been able to, to grow with the times, right? And I, so Colin Cr- uh, Crandall wanted to know, uh, you're from the same city as Megan Anderson. Did you know her or ever train with her or influence her by, at all? So actually I'm going to elaborate because your first fight uh, as an amateur was against one Megan Anderson, right? Yeah. So it was my second technically oh, okay. because I had my, I had like a C class fight, which is like with shin pads on. Um, and then she'd had one fight as well, but uh, like a B class fight, which is basically the same, but three minute rounds. So it's an amateur bout. Um, and yeah, and then we both met for both of our second fight. Um, it was a catch weight at like 64 kilos, I'd say. I can't really remember, but, um, but yeah, we fought, um, a three round fight. Um, at the time, like I was a lot younger and a lot smaller, um, because I was maybe like 18, 19. Um, but yeah, but it was great. We ended up training, I think two different times after that. Um, once at my gym on the Gold Coast and then, um, and she was also on the Gold Coast, but she was like in North Gold Coast. So we also trained up there and Jesse Jess was there as well, actually. Um, so yeah, so like we definitely like linked up, but then obviously then she left and, and I haven't seen her since, but, but yeah, it's been great just to see her journey as well like being able to follow it and being able to see the sacrifices she's made and and to get where she is now that's like amazing and well deserved because yeah i got to watch basically from us like at both of our second fights she went her way and i went my way and then obviously we both ended up in similar spots in a sense but but it's all all in all really really positive for australian MMA and coming from where we come from on the gold coast is a very very small place so yeah it's really really cool I, I think it's uh, cool that you guys, uh, I mean, especially after the, the last win, you know, you can talk about like, obviously, you know, title contention, which uh, Colin wants to know in terms of uh, fights for, for the Bellator championship, the 145 pound championship. How far do you think uh, you are from a title shot? Obviously you mentioned Arlene Glenko, uh, who just recently uh, basically tested her medal against Chris Cyborg, the, the reigning featherweight champion for Bellator. Um, and then obviously winning in the wings, you have uh, Julia Budd, you know, the former champ, you know, so in terms of like, if you're going to prospect, like how far it would take you to get a Bellator, you know, 145 pound title shot, um, how many fights do you think and how many impressive performances do you think it would take to get you? I do think it's one of those divisions that, pretty much everyone is maybe two, three wins away from a title shot, um, especially with the only clear contender was Arlene. And she still basically is, like, even though she lost, she still basically is the the number one contender in a sense, um, as well as Julia. And But obviously they both just fought and they both lost, unfortunately. So therefore it's sort of like you 
you probably don't want to see those rematches for another few fights, like for each of the girls, like for Chris to fight a couple more times and for Julia and Arlene to fight a couple more times for them to come back together maybe in the future. But sure, but for that reason, then it really opens up a little bit of a spot for all of us other girls that are a little bit maybe sitting on one or two wins. Then therefore, like, yeah, you're maybe two, three fights away from a title shot. Like, I would say personally... Um, I have four fights on these, this contract, so I've just fought once. So maybe two or three wins away from a title shot, I would definitely say would be in the mid. So probably like 2022, like around about that time, you would expect a title shot coming from me. But again, like you just never really know, especially with everything going on, if like we spoke about off air, if I'll be able to come back in February with everything locking down, if I'll be able to like keep this momentum going, I guess, in a sense. And then what Chris is going to do in the meantime, like who she needs to fight. And I mean, like you've seen with Julia, she fought some girls that maybe only had one or two fights, but they were like one or two nice wins. And then she fought them straight away. They got to fight for the title. So you can kind of expect these kind of things to happen just because it's more about opportunity and who's available and time timing really um to see what happens but i would say like another two wins at least i would definitely be at least like number one contender or within that title shot range so yeah which i think it's uh, kind of fun when you especially when you think about the trajectory of your your fight contract you're right you fought the first of four fights of your contract and you know, let's say you know two fights and you get a title shot in that fourth fight um uh, it's you're kind of be in the same or similar situation that Ryan Bader was, you know, when he won the title and it's just like, Hmm, pay me more money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's like one of those things that usually a lot of people think you usually fight out your whole contract, but you usually fight maybe like, 90% of your contract and before that last fight then that's when you start renegotiating and you start really like looking towards the future so it's sort of like it's like a, that weird MMA thing with contracts and like fighting and everything it's like how you've set your contracts up and like what that means and all that sort of stuff so yeah it's interesting for sure absolutely now in terms of like the featherweight you know kind of landscape obviously you know, Chris Cyborg is the reigning and defending champ in Bellator. You've got Amanda Nunes, both having the 135 and 145-pound titles, respectively. So, Colin Crandall wants to know, do you, how do you feel about the hope for the women's featherweight division and to get bigger and better a lot sooner? I really do think, like, um, mainly with Bellator kind of headlining it and, and really paving the way for signing all these girls and it being such a deep division um, for a female division, I do feel like for that reason it's going to get more popular. Someone like uh, um, Kayla, I forgot her last name, Judo Kayla, um, um, can, coming can from PFL. Yeah. Yes, Harrison, that's it. Um, coming down from lightweight to a featherweight, um, fight, which is a big, big deal. I think those kind of things will really create, and I mean, a lot of bantamweights coming up to featherweight. I mean, I used to be a bantamweight as well. So coming up to bantamweight, making it a lot more popular, making it kind of like that division that a lot of spectators want to see as well, because we're a little bit bigger. We have a little bit more power behind us, all that sort of stuff. It keeps us interesting. And, um, and then having someone like Chris Cyborg leading the way for it is just phenomenal because I would say she would be definitely pound for pound one of the greatest of all time women's fighting. So for that reason, like it's definitely got a lot of eyes on it. And I think, um, so therefore girls that are maybe within that sort of bent and weight to lightweight bracket would definitely be looking at, at staying in featherweight as much as they can, because that's where the fights are. And that's kind of a good place to be at the moment. So I reckon it'll skyrocket within the next year or so. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I love that you mentioned about the, the depth, of the, you know, the Bellator featherweight and bantamweight women's divisions, because I mean, it's not, just, I mean, we, we talked about Arlene Blenka. We, we talked about Julia Budd, the former champ, the current champ, and Chris Cyborg. But I mean, with the signings of obviously Leslie Smith, again, a name, uh, or even uh, Liz Carmouche, right? Like those are, yeah. those are big deals. And that's not, yeah. and, and those are just, you know, kind of like carryovers from the UFC. We're not even talking about like the homegrown, you know, uh, you know, fighters out of Bellator and the ones that Bellator themselves have 
prospected from Invicta or the regional scene all over the world, you know, bringing him yeah. in from, uh, I mean, literally eight Southeast Asia and everything. So I, I think the, the women's at 135 and 145 respectively, I think Bellator has a, a, a notch, a feather in their cap of having the deepest women's divisions in both, both divisions. I think so too. I think like having like the Kat Zinganos and the Leslie Smiths and all these girls, it's great and it builds the division and then it kind of gives it their own credibility. Like you said, having these girls that they've built up, people like Olga Rubin, people like me, people like Arlene that they built up, like they had Arlene pretty much the whole time. It's not like she fought on that many other international promotions and she's a phenomenal star in her own accord, like by... Her, like and then same with Julia. I mean, Julia was obviously on Strike Force, and and you can give her that credit. But but ultimately, the bulk of her achievements were in Bellator, and that sort of like gives Bellator its own credibility, and it's really really cool because it means like we're not trying to. I mean, like a lot of the divisions in Bellator is all you try kind of like take some of the UFC names, bring them over, bring that exposure over, and it's positive. But um, then you look at someone like Pitbull and, and so, like all these like really great like home, like Juan Archuleta and um, uh, the Wolf, I forget his name as well, but like some, and Daniel Lima and all these guys that like really kind of stayed over there, like in Bellator for the bulk of their achievements. And that those kind of like achievements that they did make gives it a lot of credibility and it gives Bellator sort of that name that it is like a promotion to be to be definitely keeping an eye on. Absolutely. Now, uh, in terms of, uh, and Paul wants to know, in terms of considering fighting at Bantamweight, obviously you've done it uh, a number of times in your career, would you consider, you know, kind of floating back to that division or do you feel 145 is home? Right now, I want to achieve everything that I want in the 145 pound division, but it's definitely always been, even like after I woke up on weight again, for, I like looked at my teammates and I was like, so bent on weight. And they were like, yeah, like not right now, but yeah, like obviously it's an idea and it's always been something that I've wanted to do. I mean, everything that I want to achieve in MMA is unlimited, but like being double champ in some way, shape or form is always something that I've had my eye on. Um, and because 135 is so attainable, um, it'll like, it'll suck <laughs> to go back to 135 after living my best life at 145. But at the same time, of course, it's something that I can easily do. And, uh, and hopefully I can go cross division, like cross promotion, possibly, you know, UFC, like featherweight champion, Bellator featherweight champion, and maybe even like, once Bellator open up their bantamweight division, that's once I maybe the time that I'll start moving down. Like you never know. Like however it sort of paves its way out, it's definitely something that's always been on my sights. And and these kind of things are all legacy achieving things that I want to do for sure. And I, I love that, right? Where you're thinking about legacy, not just like career, but legacy. Like what the long, you know, lasting impact of everything that you're doing right now what that will leave for, I mean, essentially a generation of fighters to do, not just in Australia, but I mean, the world over. 100%. I think it's like something that I recognized really early on. Um, even after, even after I fought Jesse Jess, uh, like early in my career, it was just like, I realized how much these little things affect the generation that's coming behind and then also i guess like those those girls that are watching like it's not just about me anymore it's just it's more about the impact that i can make the influence i can have on people in a positive hopefully positive way as much as i that's my always my intention um and then therefore like legacy like i, I don't want to leave this earth without having my own impact and, and really leaving my name like there's no way that my name won't be an internationally recognized brand by the time my my time is done so i like for that reason these are these are the things that have been on my mind it's always been from the get-go it's more than just sport and it's more than just winning one belt one time it's more about like what is the most we can achieve and how much can i be like how, how much can i do to be the the best woman's 
women's mixed martial artist in, in the world. So yeah, like it's never really about putting myself in these small boxes. And, and I think for that reason, I credit my mom for g giving me the, I guess that self-belief, but, but yeah, like it's, it's how much and, and infinite possibilities of what you can do for, for that word legacy for sure. I love it. Now <laughs> at the age that you are now, do you feel that you're in your prime or you, you think there's still some like room to kind of grow athletically as well as skill set? I think there's always room to grow and I'll probably say this even in a couple more years and then even a couple more years after that for sure. But I do feel like now is a great time for me that I've finally leveled out on a lot of things. My skill set has really um, sort of come together. Well, it's like one of those things that I even saw um, – I think her name is Ashley Yoda. She said, like, it's hard to keep everything even because you, you dwell in maybe boxing like I did last year and then you let go of your jiu-jitsu and then it doesn't, like, all combine. So I finally feel like at 26 and, and for the things that I've done in the last few years – after traveling, after moving around and everything, it's like I finally got everything to settle on like a, a even playing field. And it's like my MMA game has finally sort of come to, to pass. And I think that was really evident in that last fight as, as well. Um, but for that reason, it still means that I've got so much more to learn and so much more that I can do with that. Like now that everything's kind of leveled out, I can just level that all up together and I can bring it all up as a whole and we can just critique that last performance. We've got 15 minutes of footage that we can critique, which is amazing. Um, but with the win rather than having the loss, you're, it's always great to learn and win rather than learn and lose. So um, for that reason, like I, I, I think maybe – I think in a couple of years, I'll really be in my absolute prime. But right now, it's a, it's a great place for me to be. And I'm exactly where I need to be on my journey um, and my trajectory forward, I think. Well, you know, it's uh, there's that adage about, you know, uh, being the, the, the strong puppy with the, the, you know, like the grown up paws, you know, so. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that's not a bad place to be. Mm, exactly. And I mean, like, if you ever think that you're at truly at your prime, then you're most likely not as well. So you're stunting your own growth if you ever think that you don't have anything more to learn, because I always know that, that there's so much more to learn. But I also have that, um, I guess, inner credibility to know that I've learned a lot during my career. And as much as I don't have the experience that some of these girls have, someone like Jesse has, um, I know that the way I understand the sport, the things that I experienced in my career, these will all pay dividends now. And now is the time that I'm all, I'm getting all my sacrifices, all my mistakes, my little hic hiccups, my losses, all of these things are all starting to pay off now because I've channeled them in, in a positive way and I've, I've used them to my advantage and I've learned my lessons. So therefore I think um, it's one of those things you've got to have that little bit of ego to tell you that you know what the fuck you're doing and you know like way that you're meant to be here and you deserve to be here but at the same time there's always infinite more to learn so so i think um it's only up from here for sure i love it i love it now in terms of like we'll take it back to the fight right so i mean one of your your biggest performance today and we kind of spoke at the top of, the, of this very podcast about you know you being the consummate underdog and, and you were actually a bit favored in this this particular instance so uh, talk us through the fight like obviously as jim ross would say it was a slobber knocker uh, obviously a week and a half after you're still kind of you know just now starting to dissipate the uh the scars of war uh, so to speak so um talk to us about the fight how did you feel yeah i feel like um yeah, like we said, I, I would have expected to be a little bit more of an underdog than I was, um, but the, the odds are pretty close. Um, I also feel like I feel like it was like a fairly clean fight from the both of us. Like there was a lot of those nitty gritty kind of ugly positions, mainly in the cage and mainly on the ground that were a little bit um, stagnant in a sense. But at the same time, I feel like I... I felt at the time when I was in the fight that my striking wasn't very clean, but then once I watched it back, I was like, okay, like it is a little bit better than what I expected. Um, obviously, there's things to work on, and, uh, and I'm my biggest critic when it comes to that kind of stuff as well anyway, but <clears throat> all in all, I feel like it was really, it was a really clean performance from us both to show 
both of our IQ um, to show different areas and different disciplines for it to have gone a little bit on the feet, a little bit on the ground, a little bit of the um, the cage control and a little bit of wrestling and I guess like throwing and stuff like that. All the in-between stuff really showed that both of us um, are well experienced and well rounded um, and that we both didn't fit into our um, cookie cutters of grapple versus striker. So, so for that reason, like I thought it was really good um, for us. And then um, again, like from my own perspective, I, I'm really like proud of how much, as much as like the the game plan was very vague in a sense, but at the same time, none of the things that I wanted to do were happening. And usually, a younger, less mature version of myself would have possibly freaked out a little bit, gone for the finish a little bit too eagerly and um and i think wasted a lot of those jiu-jitsu positions by um trying to attack the ground and pound and maybe getting caught in a sub or something like that like i do feel like a younger version of me would have maybe um rushed things and freaked out a little bit and panicked to try to get the finish because i was maybe thinking that that was the only way i could win but um in the same like so that's why i kind of like watched it back and i was like wow that that's really good that i made those decisions i problem solved to the situation and i made sure that every round i ended up on top or i, I ended up in a pot like a positive place and like mentally like i wasn't even really looking at the time in a sense but i just knew like it was that time of the round that now we have to do something like to to end up on top or, or whatever it is i know that i always go for the finish but um I'm glad that I did it in like a more controlled and like positive way that I didn't do anything stupid. Um, someone like Jesse, who obviously, like we said, is a black belt. I didn't, didn't catch me in anything crazy um, because I was making the mistakes. I feel like um, because of that, it really saved me and it, it really made me kind of able to pop off my ground and pound and, and finish on top pretty much every round. So yeah, it was really good. Yeah. And uh, I love that you mentioned about the, uh, you know, the maturity, right? Because uh, you can get into those like, oh man, I see the finish line. And you got to remember, it's a, you know, like the old adage says, it's a, it's not a foot race, it's a marathon, right? Hmm. And it's like, you have to find that heavy medium between pushing the action, obviously wanting to get the finish, 100% I want to win, like I will do anything to win. But at the same time, there's a difference between pushing the action and um, making silly mistakes and kind of just like, being eager in the wrong, wrong way. So you have to find that heavy medium between, all right, how do I win the fight long term? But how do I also maybe try to find the finish or maybe let the finish like present itself to me in a sense, but by also pushing the action. So it's sort of like, is that weird thing? Like I always want to be exciting, obviously, when I fight. And that's sort of what I'm known for in a sense. Like even my losses generally have been pretty exciting so um it's sort of just one of those things you have to find that heavy medium and i feel like i'm so glad that i showed that to myself that i can do that like that i actually know how to do that i love it i love it now in terms of I, i'll take away because obviously we can try to mma math like the whole kind of you know rankings and in such and, and where it would place you in terms of title contention for the 145 pound world title so let's let's kind of sidestep that if you were to pick any past or present like female fighter uh to fight in a dream match scenario uh who would it be and why um it's always been gina carana i um she was definitely like one of the main reasons that i guess i was like i want to do this as a career yeah <laughs> so um we just got a delivery sorry we just got a delivery of, um, it's my coach's birthday, and he just hey. got another cat. Happy birthday, coach. <laughs> oh, I want to actually, I feel like you guys should see this because yeah, this is going to be an side. amazing cake. Oh, oh my gosh. What you got? It's like, a, oh, I think you have to open the box, like, from the side. Pull it out. It'll bite so you. So that's like the, Oh, so you're going to pull this up and it'll just pour down. So you should get maybe like a plate or something. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and maybe you should wait until I'm done and then I can video it. Because <laughs> that's important. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It might be a little bit melted. 
Maybe put it in the fridge and then we'll take it out. But that's the exciting part of our day. Our quarantine day of my coach's birthday, being stuck in quarantine. That's pretty committed coach to have come overseas with me and then having to spend two weeks in quarantine on his birthday. <laughs> but we're trying to make it as fun as possible. And um, that cake's going to be amazing. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, like, sorry, back to your question. Like you said, Gina Carano is definitely always being one of my 100% dream, dream, dream fights. Um, she was one of the, like, it wasn't like I got into MMA because of her, but once I was into MMA, obviously I started looking into what all this fuss was about, how to look, and um, she was definitely one of those reoccurring people that I was like, okay, cool, like, that's someone that I can kind of relate to. She just seems like a normal lady. Um, we kind of, it was like back then where you were like, this is 10, 11 years ago when you're getting that whole stigma that the only like butch kind of aggressive girls are really like succeeding in MMA. And that's not at all true. I think MMA is literally a platform for everyone and anyone. And as much as like it may not be the same as me, like I still am inviting to everyone, like whether they be like that kind of like ass out kind of on Instagram, whether they be like that butch kind of like gay, yeah. like it, it doesn't matter. Like whatever it is, it's all for us. Like all of it is MMA. Like it doesn't change it. And that's the same as males. Like it doesn't change it. You can be like a stoner. You can be from the hard knocks. You can be like cookie cutter, like preppy, like private school kid doesn't matter it's all mma and it's all a sport for everyone and i think like that's really why i was just like okay gina carano like that's someone i look up to that's someone i always gravitate her style is very aggressive very like me she likes standing she likes brawling i was like yep yeah, that's that's the lady that's who's definitely influencing me to, to make this thing like a, a big deal no i i love it you know and uh, obviously she I mean, in addition to being like strike first, you know, title contender. And I mean, she gets lost in the shuffle because I mean, pretty, it, it's kind of crazy to think about, right? The strike force challenger series that Daniel Cormier and Ronda Rousey were actually like, uh, not even on the TV, like portion of, you know, Gina Carano cards, right? Yeah, exactly. And then it's like once she fought Cyborg, it was almost like everyone kind of like forgot about her or wrote her off. And it's just like, man, there's no way that they were really like the same way or a whole lot of like a whole lot of things. So, but for that reason, she never said no to any fights. She always came to play the game. She always came to throw down. And I was just like, I'm, I want to be like that lady in a sense. Like, obviously, put my own spin on things and and create my own legacy. I'm never going to be a replica of anyone. But if I can take anything away, it's definitely Definitely that inspirational kind of like no bullshit just fight like it's not about anything else but fighting and she just held it so elegantly as well being obviously one of like a prettier lady and, and someone a little bit more feminine it was just it was just good to see I know uh, absolutely I, I fuck yeah man that, that's a good one and I love the people that you know kind of uh, acknowledge it and honor her because like again because you, you see what she's doing and the Mandalorian or the Fast and Furious movies, you kind of forget, like, oh, she was a badass way before all of this shit. Yeah, exactly. And then she, like, another inspirational thing is that she made something out of it. She, she was doing all this kind of thing before Ronda Rousey, and it's not to take it away from Ronda Rousey, but it's just also to give her credit and not get her lost in, in these kind of, um, I guess, like, legacy and, and, and journey kind of things. It's like her career path went from MMA, she got so much exposure and then she made something from it. She made a massive opportunity for herself and now she's hopefully set herself up for life, which is amazing. I think what other ma male or female, other fighters should aspire to do to make sure that you look beyond fighting. We can't fight forever. Like it's not, I'm not making this shit up. It's just how it is. And for that reason, like you need to think, what are you going to make of your legacy after fighting? And is there more to it than just fighting? So to so create more than a one-dimensional person and then therefore you can kind of do these really cool things like Ronda Rousey and Gina Carano and everyone else as well. No, I fucking love it. I fucking love it. But what I want to know, right? Because obviously you guys are going to chow down on your coach's cake and everything like that. So Eventually. what was the post uh, like fight, the celebration, whether that be here in, uh, in the States in uh, Mohegan Sun or when you got back to Australia, like what was like the victory meal that you absolutely had to have? 
Well, I've already fought at the Mohegan Sun before, and um, I specifically remember, and the Mohegan is amazing. For those who haven't been there, it has everything that you could want, like literally everything. There's a Lush in there. There's like a coach in there if you want to go fancy. There's a Victoria's Secret in there. There's a Sephora in there. But even better, there is Ben and Jerry's in there. There is um, Duncan. There's... Krispy Kreme, there's Chick-fil-A, there's like a massive bakery, there's a couple of Italian restaurants, there's a Mexican restaurant, there's sushi, there's like everything that you could want. And I remember last time I fought, um, when I fought Sinead Kavanaugh, um, I, we fought early, obviously we were on the prelims, I went back out, watched the fights, and then went to Chick-fil-A and they closed on me, and I was so sad. So this time, obviously the positive about... Um, one negative was I had to get stitches, which was a bit annoying because it took a couple of hours. But then I went straight back, had a shower, straight to Chick-fil-A. Like, that was literally, like, <laughs> straight to Chick-fil-A because we don't have that in Australia. Um, was, uh, one of my favorite American fast foods, definitely, by far. Um, we got Chick-fil-A. We sat around. Um, there's, like, these cool little fires outside at the Mohegan. And um, not to advocate um, banned substances, but... but we had a little bit of bud, which was really good. So that was Chick-fil-A, fire, outdoors. It was like a beautiful night in Connecticut. It wasn't too cold, but it was a little bit cold, but it was like just enough. Next to the lake, next to the beautiful like rainforest kind of vibes. A little bit of bud. I was living my best life. It was so good. I got my stitches done. Everything was fine. There was no pain, no nothing. Like, I didn't have any pain on my face or anything. I had this pimple that I've had like for two weeks and it got like bruised a little bit but other than that like my face was fine I don't have any broken bones or anything it was honestly perfect definitely I think it's absolutely <laughs> fucking brilliant absolutely fucking brilliant and you know in terms of the substance we're finding out more and more that hey you know it actually helps people one and uh I mean in I'm in California so we've legalized it for quite a while now but I mean at least we're not Oregon <laughs> Oregon literally uh, basically was like <laughs> that went everything, crazy. Everything like cocaine, <laughs> black tar. We're spending like, too much taxpayers' money on stuff, and so they're just like, "Ah, eh, fuck it." I think that's what they. I heard that. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I mean, we'll we'll see about a year's time how that kind of shakes out, but I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, seriously, I, I think it's yeah. I mean, it's it's all in a good time. Now, obviously, yeah. I mean, there's been a litany of people that you have helped you get to where you are. So uh, let's get it in order and uh, shout out the people that you want to acknowledge as well as sponsors. For sure. Um, first and foremost, obviously, I want to thank all my teams. At the moment, I am with King's Academy, like I said, over Sinistic. Great gym there. All my really, really good training partners. Um, my head MMA coach is Renato Subacic, which is um, we have kind of like our own little team at MMA FFT, which is fight for the family, which is really cool. Um, it's just a really good team, and I appreciate all those guys coming out every week. Um, we also have movement, strength and conditioning. My guy, Maddie, who has looked after me, took me up on late notice too for this fight, but really took me on board and went above and beyond for everything, like explaining to me like what my whoop scores mean, what my sleep meant, like what my all these certain things. So that's been really, really good. Um, that's pretty much all my team done, but for that reason yeah we'll go into sponsors so ruka obviously always love ruka pretty much always wearing ruka if anyone can not tell combat the combat nutrition guys they're the guys that are fueling all my nutrition which i really really appreciate it all my supplements and everything um the fight dietitian does all my work for um like food nutrition all my meal plans and everything that's why i'm wake up on weight that's why i'm feeling the best i am so i'm looking better each fight which is really cool um and then my sweat deck, um, innovative, jumped on board. We had um, BF nine to five, um, which are really cool guys that jumped on board. We had Christian. Um, who else do we have? I feel like I'm feeling once. AGE, um, HGE, sorry. And um, and then of course, thanks to Ruby, um, my management company that's always looking after me. But yeah. I'm pretty sure I've got most of the people. I probably forgot people, but whatever. They get my Instagram shout outs and everything anyway. <laughs> shout out your mom. Oh, yeah, always. Always. So, usually, the first thing I did, and I don't know if you guys saw my fight, but that was the first thing I said to the camera. But love you, mom. She's the one who made me who I am, and definitely why I am where I am, 100%.
Absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. But you, my dear, have some cake to attend to. And uh, happy birthday to the coach. So happy birthday, coach. Uh, but uh, thank you guys for joining us here. Thank you, Janae, for taking time out of your day to do this here at According to Woods. And uh, I mean, if you guys haven't already done so, I, we warmly encourage you to subscribe to According to Woods, right? And I mean, Janae, you're subscribed, right? Yeah, yeah, I am now. <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean, just don't take our word for it. Here's professional wrestler Zeta Zhang. Hey, this is Zeta Zhang. Make sure you subscribe to According to Woods.